Um, I'd like to begin, first and foremost, um, in an intentional and genuine way, as we can all summon, um, an acknowledgement of the land on which we gather. Toronto is part of the Dish with One Spoon territory, named for a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of Indian Creek. This treaty bound them to share the territory and to protect the land of the Dish, which represents what is now known as Southern Ontario. Since its creation, subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers, have been incorporated into the treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. We extend our gratitude to the past, present, and future elders and teachers who carry the knowledge of this land, and we are truly grateful for the opportunity to create, to live, learn, read, and write on this land together. Thank you. My name is Jill Deacon. Um, Julian always makes me feel like I'm in trouble. Um, I am perhaps best known in this building as host of Here and Now on CBC Radio 1. I'm also the author of three books. Uh, it looks like yellow in print, so it says Julian on the book titles. Um, I also served as uh, the board, uh, as a member of the board of the Writers' Trust for seven years. And I learned a lot in that time about the crucial support that Writers' Trust provides to the writers who live on this land, now called Canada. Tonight is an opportunity to celebrate Canadian writers and Canadian writing. And I feel like part of that means that we should all take a moment to think about what writers have done for us lately. I know that everyone in this room and watching on the live stream by virtue of being here appreciates and values a good book. Always have, always will. But in the exquisitely challenging times from which we now tentatively and hopefully emerge, think about what writers did for us. Scientists helped us find the light switch and the exit from the terrifying pandemic experience, and bless them, everyone. But writers kept us company in the dark. However isolated we all were through lockdowns and restrictions, we were less so with the book in our hands. The writers in this room, in this country, and everywhere else perform their miracles alone in their quiet spaces so that we can feel less alone in ours. So, a very deeply felt thank you to the storytellers, the conjurers, the wonderers, and the investigators honored here tonight. Your work is invaluable, and we know that now after COVID, maybe more than ever. And the work of the Writers' Trust, tireless, and targeted support that keeps writers going is invaluable too. These prizes are great and they are game-changing, but there is also year-round effort by the Writers' Trust that makes those Canadian authors in their quiet spaces feel a little less alone themselves. Over the course of this evening, we are going to be highlighting the individual foundation and corporate benefactors that make tonight's various prizes possible and I would like to take a moment to acknowledge a few additional sponsors and partners that help to support the Writers' Trust. They are, government partner is the Department of Canadian Heritage, the media partner the Golden Mail, Indigo Books and Music, Quill and Choir and Steam Whistle Brewery are also, the Brewing are also partners. So big thank you. Uh, to them for the role that they play in making tonight happen. And I thank you, our guests, uh, for being here, for joining in in a celebration of Canadian literary experience. It just wouldn't be the same if you weren't here. So, shall we begin? Uh, we're going to start with a prize that's actually new to this ceremony. Um, and it's a prize that is unique in the landscape of Canadian literary prizes. Uh, and inclusive, intersectional, 
groundbreaking since its inception. To pre present tonight's first prize, the Dane Ogilvy Prize for LGBTQ2S plus writers, please welcome prize founder and principal donor, Robin Pacific. I'd just like to acknowledge two people in the audience. One is Gary Aikenhead, Dane's widow, and the other is Don Orobeck, who was the executive director of the Writers' Trust. When I rolled into his office and said, why don't we start a prize for, you know, in honor of my friend, and Don took it on, and we would not be here doing this tonight had it not been for his early efforts. In 2007, this prize was established to honor my late friend, Dane Ogilvy, a respected editor, writer, literary manager, and passionate lover of all the arts. Over its 15-year history, the Dane Ogilvy Prize has rewarded 40 emerging writers who have gone on to publish dozens of books, win awards nationally and internationally, and who represent the creativity, community, and talent of Canada's LBGTQ2S plus writers. Tonight, for the first time in its history, this prize takes center stage at the Writers' Trust Awards. I think this is the rightful place for the Dane Ogilvy, and I believe that now, more than ever, Dane would be pleased and proud to see his name attached to the prize. Dane was the second oldest of eight children in a working class family in Moncton, New Brunswick. His older brother, David, died in prison. His youngest brother, Danny, a gifted photographer, died of AIDS. Dane never recovered from Danny's death, along with the death to AIDS of so many friends and lovers. He died at 56 of a heart attack, but I've always believed that he died of a broken heart. Dane was an out loud and out proud gay man. He believed that being gay is a spiritual calling. He was outrageously funny and sex was never far from the laughter. I once asked him during a very serious conversation if he believed in God. He threw up his arms, cackled, and said loudly in a crowded restaurant, praise the Lord and pass the chaotic of white jelly. <laughs> He was full of rage and he was full of love. I will always miss him and it is such a comfort and honor for me that his name lives on in the Dane Ogilvy Prize. Dane, your queen for a day. <laughs> this year's jury was composed of writers Billy Ray Belcourt, Samra Habib, and Zoe Lee Peterson. Together they chose three debut books published since January 2020 by LGBTQ2S plus authors. I thank them for their service on the jury and the incredibly difficult task they faced in selecting this year's finalists and winner. The jury used such words as sacred, sensuous, and endlessly innovative to describe this year's finalists. After this, I suggest you purchase their books to find out which is which. <laughs> I am pleased now to present to you the shortlist for the 2022 Dane Ogilvy Prize. Acha Bacha by Bilal Bey, published by Favorites Canada Press. Butter Honey Pig Bread by Francesca Ekuyazi, published by Arsenal Pop Press. And White Man Walking by Matthew James Weigel, published by Coach House Books. Congratulations again to all of these three very exceptional writers. And the winner here of the 2022 Dane Ogilvy Prize for LGBTQ 2S Plus Emerging Writers, including a price, a prize of $10,000 is Francesca Ecclesi. <laughs>
gratitude. Um, I'm really grateful to my friend Hannah for being here, uh, for the writer's trust, um, <laughs> to a specific, um, to the jury, jurors, uh, to Arsenal Club, thanks to everyone there, and to Cheryl Rose. Um, yeah, I'm just really, really, really grateful. So this is literally my dream, is to write and be paid for it and have people be interested. So. <laughs> to the 
jury. I'm grateful to the Writers' Trust, and I'm so glad that you're all here to, to um, share this celebration. I met Matt Cohen only once. It would have been about 30 years ago. I was, um, a, I was in my early 40s, I guess, a relatively young widow with an 11-year-old, and I was also very scared. A lump was growing in my body where no lump was supposed to be, and the doctors couldn't figure out what was happening. And it was in the midst of this crisis that I fell into conversation with Matt and ended up telling him my troubles. He listened, we said goodbye, and I thought that would be the end of that. I never imagined anything more would come of it. But a short time later, out of the blue, out of the blue I received a letter from the writer's trust and a handsome check drawn on the Woodcock Fund. <laughs> Matt had not only listened, but he put things in motion to send help when it was needed. In the end, I was fine, and life went on, but I will never forget that quiet, sustaining act of kindness. And so now, here are Matt Cohen and the Writer's Trust with another breathtaking surprise. What makes this award especially delicious is that it seems to acknowledge aspects of my personality that is often mistaken for faults. <laughs> for instance, this award is a rebuke to that grade two teacher <laughs> in Dawson Creek, British Columbia, who complained that candy tends to talk too much? <laughs> <laughs> of course, candy talks in class. She has something to say. <laughs> and the award waggles a finger at the volunteer librarian in Beaver Lodge, Alberta, <laughs> a few weeks later, or a few years later, who watched the preteen come in with a teetering pile of summer reading and exploded with. Well, the librarian said, you certainly haven't been helping your mother very much. <laughs> <laughs> Happily, my mother also had a nose in the book, but her formative role in my writing life is a story that will wait for another day. Best of all, this award offers a validation for my appallingly bad attitude. <laughs> I was barely into my 20s when I decided that regular employment wasn't really a good fit. <laughs> as far as I was concerned, having a job meant going somewhere I didn't want to go to do things I didn't want to do with people I didn't want to be with. <laughs> And yet, with the steadfast support of people who apparently saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, and Rob Sanders, yes, I am talking about you, through the transition from manual typewriters to electrics, and from cassette tapes to floppies to memory sticks and the cloud, book by book and year by year, this miraculous writing life has continued that again in the present tense. This miraculous writing life continues. I am deeply grateful for this award and for so much more. Thank you. Please welcome Children's Book Author, 2009 winner of this prize, and juror for this year's prize, Martha Jocelyn. Good evening. More than 50 years ago, Vicki Metcalf created 
needed a prize to celebrate the writing of literature for Canadian children, one that honored writers who took creative risk and demonstrated sustained excellence throughout their careers. In founding the award, Vicki Metcalf helped to establish a community of writers that is strong, vibrant, and imaginative. At their best, authors of books for children do nothing less than instill a love of stories in generations of devoted, lifelong readers. It is fitting that we are making this presentation on I Read Canadian Day, on which nearly 3,000 schools, roughly 100,000 children, participated across the country today. On behalf of the Writers' Trust, I am grateful to the Metcalf Foundation for making possible this $25,000 award. It is especially meaningful that an award celebrating the confluence of young people, writers, and creativity is included among Writers' Trust prizes, reminding us, if we need it, that remarkable artistry is required to write well, whether for an audience of young children, teenagers, or adults. I was lucky to serve on the jury this year alongside Hadley Dyer and Matab Narsiman, two of the most careful and thoughtful readers with whom I have ever had the pleasure to work. And now to the recipient of this year's award. Our citation reads, Bottomless wit, an inimitable, inimitable, inimitable style, and a strong lacing of social commentary are just some of the elements that impress the jury about the extraordinary body of work of this year's winner. Informative and fact-based, yet often delightfully absurd, her books cover a vast spectrum of topics from gender identity and stereotypes to kids who adopt monsters, a mushroom fan club, and many disgusting critters. The author and illustrator of well over 50 books, she brilliantly introduces difficult subjects in an accessible and engaging manner with subversive humor that thrills readers of every age. To crack open a book by this year's Vicki Metcalf Award winner is to embark on an unpredictable and memorable journey with plenty of laughs along the way. The winner of the 2022 Vicki Metcalf Award for Literature for Young People and $25,000 is Elise Grova.
French uh, immersion elementary school. And uh, my job was to uh, plan activities and fun things to do with kids just so they would practice French in a fun environment. And uh, I loved that. And my favorite part was drawing with kids and uh, just like mostly everything that was uh, around fart jokes. So when I came back to Montreal, I decided to continue this fling I had with drawing that I hadn't really explored earlier in my life. And I started uh, learning uh, graphic design. I went to graphic design school. And we had illustration classes, which I really liked. And so I thought I might give it a try as a career. But when I came out of school, I didn't have any clients because I was a nobody and nobody knew me and I didn't have a style. So I decided to uh, make up clients and to illustrate ads for them. So I invented clients and products that don't exist and that are very silly and that nobody would want to buy. Like stuff like boxing gloves that are furry for boxers with delicate skin, or <laughs> a leash for your goldfish, or uh, well, I think I had a squirt gun lighter for people who want to quit smoking. It's a really good invention. And I illustrated ads for those for those products and I had lots of fun. And when I had 20 or so ads like that, I put them all on the floor in my bedroom and looked at them and I thought, like, this is funny. I think kids would find it funny too. And so I copied those images and sent them to publishers everywhere. And um, after the usual hundreds of rejections, finally someone said yes. And uh, a publisher in Quebec published those books, the, the, those illustrations of the book. And by magic, my illustrations became a picture book for kids. Mm -hmm. And that was great. It was a really great feeling. And, uh, well, it didn't sell. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I still had fun writing it, and so I decided to keep writing more books like that. And so I wrote and illustrated more books, and then they still didn't sell. And I had many years of going to book fairs and sitting alone at my table, looking at people like that, with a big smile, trying to appear not threatening so they would come and look at my book. <laughs> but after a few years at book fairs, at some point I started seeing a few people at my table coming to tell me that they like my book, and, and then more kids, and then at some point I started selling books, and then some publishers from the United States started um, reaching out to me books there and in France and and in the end my, my career started to be doing very well and now it's, it's going well for me I wrote I've written more than 60 books for kids and uh, I think I'm, I'm sorry <laughs> I don't keep count so but uh, deep down um, like I think 99% of my colleagues who write for children um, I have the imposter syndrome and I keep uh, questioning the validity of my work. Like this can't be a real job, right? Like, uh, writing books for kids, especially if they're full of fart jokes like mine, they, it, it can't be serious, it can't be a real work, it can't be important. So that's why I'm extremely grateful for awards like this one. I thank the Metcalf Foundation for reminding us that writing for kids has value and that it, it's a real job. And that yes, we are real writers too. Uh, thank you for making me realize that having fun doing something doesn't mean that that something is not important. Thank you. It is my honor to present the Writers' Trust Engel Finley Award 
which recognizes a writer of fiction in mid-career. While this award comes with a prize of $25,000, it is equally important in its endorsement of this author's craft and courage. As the beneficiaries of the Timothy Finley Estate, Writers' Trust is especially pleased to be able to reward an author who, like both Tiff Finley and Marion Engel, dedicated their careers to the very hard, very essential business of telling our stories. May receiving this acclaim and knowing it is named for two such important authors from our past long be a source of encouragement to tonight's winner. Before I reveal the winner, I would like to express gratitude to the jurors, authors Carol Bruneau and Sean Michaels. Together, they read the best that contemporary Canadian literature has to offer. On behalf of Writers' Trust, I thank them for the thoroughness and thoughtfulness they brought to their reading and their decisions. Here's what the jury said about this year's winner. For three decades, she has been writing some of this country's most original and incandescent fiction. With a deep understanding and a fearless devotion, she worries at the knot of identity and transformation, revealing in an ever-expanding way the cost of pursuing one's dreams. Her novels and stories transport us, set variously against the lushness of the tropics and the stark relief of Canadian winters. They peel back the layers of emotion experienced by those who resist cultural, racial, and sexual hegemony. People whose identities and upbringing are at perilous odds with their desires. Her books are alive, audacious, and full of craft. It's a body of work that inspires us with all its care and unselfconscious trajectory. My fellow book lovers, please join us in celebrating the winner of the 2022 Angle Finley Award, Shani Mutu. <laughs> videos that continue to be widely screened. 
You know, I, I would write the scripts and surround myself by people who spe with specialized skills who could also, they, they knew how to hear me and I was very fortunate to be able to find people who could actually hear me, help me with, make the work as I imagined it, and finally to make that work shine. For all intents and purposes, it's been the same with this writing. Because I hadn't planned to be a writer, when I was invited by Barbara Kuhn and Della McGrary of Proskant Publishers 30 years ago to write something for their press, that first book being a collection of short stories called Out on Main Street, I didn't exactly know how to do so, other than what I've learned in high school from reading and from my own constant private scribblings. And so I drew on my experiences in visual arts and video making. And from that first book, I was taught, and I feel to the very last, my last poetry book, that I am constantly being taught how to write by some of the most wonderful editors I've had the good fortune to work with. I love the cave part those first solitary years, but it is exiting the cave and entering into the editing process, the discussions, the agreements and disagreements, the back and forth that I so very much look forward to, the notes that make me think, oh, of course, I see. How did she see that? And I want to say a huge thank you tonight I've always wanted to do this publicly and I get to do it tonight and so I will. I want to say thank you to these editors whose work on past books always comes to bear on the cave writing part of the present one. They're an interesting kind of creature editors. How they hide themselves in the background even as they peep out to cheer us on. Left to me, I would put my editor's name on the cover of my books. I've said this from the start and I mean it. And so I want therefore to name them today. The first book, edited by Ramabai Espiné. Serious Blooms at Night by Jennifer Glossop. Poetry and Novels by Lynn Henry. One by Elizabeth Schmidt of Grove Atlantic in the US. One by Meg Story. And the last, Cave Fire, Poetry by Sandra Ridley. And I want to take the opportunity as well to say thank you to friends who've supported me and this long writing, in particular Catherine Bush, the filmmaker Richard Fung, the artist Marlene McCallum, the writer Sheila Mathers, and to the academics here and abroad who teach and write about my work. And among them I want to mention uh, Linda Mora, Dr. Linda Mora of Bishops University, and Dr. Tiago Morana of the University of Sao Paulo. And a huge thank you to my publishers of the past, and in the present, Jay and Hazel Miller of Book Hub. And the person who looks out for not just a single book, but for my career, Samantha Haywood. I want to say thank you to my family in Trinidad. You know, when I went, my, my father was not, he's a doctor and a politician. He was not interested in me becoming a writer at all, because he was also afraid. Writers tell stories about family. <laughs> and I, I remember he was encouraged to read my first novel, because he was doing well in other places, people were saying, you need to read a book. He read it and he called me up, we weren't on good terms, and he said to me, you know, we don't get along at all, but don't stop writing, and don't censor yourself, write anything you want. And I want to say thank you to the whole family. Finally, uh, above all, it is my deep pleasure to have the opportunity to publicly thank my partner, Deborah Root, who is always the first to encourage me and to brilliantly engage with me in all of my creative projects. I will do my utmost to meet the Trust's inherent expectation 
that I, at, at 65 years old, have it in me to continue writing for at least another 30 years. At least another 10 years. And then my father thanks.
people who are called the Quantman, they call us Quantman First Nation. Uh, when I teach kids, I tell them our story is, is that uh, 10,000 years ago we fell from the sky and we landed on the island where I live now. And we were told that we were allowed to take the fish from the river. And we've been fishing ever since. And that I look pretty good for being 10,058 years old. <laughs> so really? Yeah. It's uh, mostly face cream. So. <laughs> um, thank you. Oh, I have two biopics. Can you tell them? <laughs> I have one for my children's books with no, no cigarette, and then the other one's for my I get work on them. Um, anyways, um, thank you so much. Um, and January, and um, who's the other guy? Blue? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, I should do research for this study. Um, I'm always the bridesmaid when it comes to awards. I never win. Um, like, I was up for the Griffin Award um, last year, and uh, I, I'd already spent the money in my head. Um, <laughs> I just had the beautiful boat, and I was living in Mexico. Um, but I didn't win. But still, you're, you're guaranteed $10,000, and for poets, yeah, and, and 25 Gs, it's like, holy, you guys, are you sure? Are you, um, I always when I when I when I win things, I always ask the first thing I ask is, um, uh, what did I win? Did I did I win a treaty for my people? And they're like, no, no, no. <laughs> but one day I'd like to be honored with a treaty. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, that's, as, that's as political as I get. So. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, my mom was. I'm gonna get the keys to my mom. Is a survivor. Um, she was five years old and she was put on a train in Fort Langley and she was sent to uh, Cooper Island Residential School and she survived there and then she graduated from St. Mary's uh, Residential School. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just going to share a poem. Is that okay? okay. <clears throat> it's called St. Mary's Number Four. 1955. Down by the river, pup and muck fishing. Quiet Sunday afternoon. All the chores have been finished. Catholics are in the field searching for lovely flowers to pick, to smell, to pick. Pup hooks the first one, her little arms holding on, holding, pulling, pulling. The fish snaps up into the air and looks around. His eyes stare right at her. Little Indian girl, little fisherman, little gift from above. Her hands grasp the pole, her eyes widen, her breath quickens. Flowers picked out of the earth snap at the stem. Noses sniff in the air, searching for the scent of God, all his creations, now devoured by humans, flowers, fish, little Indians with crosses around their necks, flowers, lovely flowers, fish. It jumps once more and snaps the line. Going down to the bottom, down where the water is calm, it rests, swallows the fat worm, unaware of the creation, unaware. Muck gets a nibble, the hairs on his arms stand up, Catholics singing in the fields, songs about glory and salvation. Muck dances the worm, singing his song beneath his breath. He shuffles his feet, trying to remember his dance. Worm dances beneath the water. The salmon spots it, swims towards it. Hunger, dance, song, shuffle in the bare ground feet. Fields of flowers, fields of salvation. River, water, fish takes the worm. Fields of song, worm becomes a hook. The salmon snaps his head to the left and then to the right. Hook goes deeper. Little Indian arms pull him. His song gets louder. His feet quicken to the beat of the drum inside his head. He pulls, he sings, he shuffles his feet like the old days, like the days back home. He pulls the fish out of the water. He takes a small club-like branch and snaps the fish on top of the head twice. Fish stops. Muck pulls the hook and what is left of the worm out of the fish's mouth, drops it back into the river. Fields of flowers, songs of glory and salvation. Two Indian kids on the river's edge, 1955. Worms on hooks, songs, drum, paint, memories of home.
Simon was breathing songs of glory. Thank you so much. Madame sings us through the fictional life of its protagonist's grandmother. Though Corey's writing is lyrical and soothing as she resurrects the hard early life of her own grandmother, who survived the decimation of Armenia in 1915. She approaches the reality of war with words that commemorate the life of her tento. Though Corey writes, what is worse than death is forgetting. Her work fulfills the curiosity we carry of our ancestors and is a reminder to all of us to honor their lives, and more importantly, to never forget them. <coughs> what Cormac McCarthy did for cowboys and horses, Nicholas Herring does for fishermen and boats in his novel, Son Howard. With a deep knowledge of the island and a passion for the language of work, Herring's voice is droll and philosophical, ribald and poetic. The age-old story of humans versus nature finds a fresh cadence as Herring trawls the seas for body and soul. There is a dark beauty within this story that will make the reader's heart sing. Kevin Lambert's fearless novel is a profane, funny, bleak, touching, playful, and outrageous satire of sexual politics, labor, and capitalism. In a static and cutting prose, it gleefully illuminates both the broad socio-political tensions of life in a Quebec company town and the intimate details of sex, lust, loneliness, and gay relationships in such a place. Like its central character, the book is brash, beautiful, quasi-mythic, and tragic. Most improbably, for all its daring and provocation, Querer Robocra is lyrically even tenderly written. Darcy Tamayose writes from the other side. Each story in Ezra's Ghost is unique and allows us to see life from beyond exploring the aspects of grief from those who have moved on. Each character is placed inside our hearts, connecting us to the spirit of their loved one. She writes on the significance of the sacred, treading the possibility of even more life and purpose in the afterlife. Tamayose is a gifted writer whose every sentence is written with care and precision. Sometimes the writer comes along whose stories are not only complex and full and exquisitely written, but whose vision and political voice feels necessary. In her first Palestinian, Saitidi coaxes the reader in a certain direction and then flips the narrative so that now we are implicit and we see our own guilt in the great divide that exists between the privilege and the stranger. TV does this with subtle humor and a wry tone. He does not preach, yet his writing expresses a certain fervor that is essential. He is a vital voice. To present the Atwood Gibson Writers Trust Fiction Prize, please welcome author and winner of this prize in 2020 for her book, Ridge Runner, Jill Addison. Thank you so much, Jill. 
Jill. Another Jill. Um, and thank you all for being here. Uh, it is my great honor to announce the winner of this year's prize. First, though, a word about the award itself. Though it has been around for a quarter century, it recently took on a new and dynamic form. In 2021, Writers Trust renamed this esteemed fiction award for two of its co-founders, Margaret Atwood and Graham Gibson. A very deserving tribute to two pioneers in fostering a professional literary culture in Canada. Alongside its new name, the prize also found a generous new sponsor, the businessman and philanthropist Jim Balsillie. These are exciting developments for Writers Trust and for authors of fiction. Just two years ago, uh, I was fortunate enough to win the award, then called the Writers Trust Fiction Prize. Um, winning this prize, even in a pandemic, meant a great deal to me. And in significant ways, it made me feel like perhaps I hadn't done the dumbest thing with my life. <laughs> The Fiction Prize has integrity, and the Writers Trust understands and cares about writers as writers. Being nominated at all was and is manifestly a good thing. It's a leg up and a vote of confidence from your peers. Uh, as Jill said, it's, uh, it's all about your awesomeness. <laughs> the 2022 shortlist takes us to Anatolia, Prince Edward Island, a northern lumber town in Quebec, a quiet city on the prairie, Palestine, and a few places in between. We're taken into both the past and the afterlife, into conflict and grief, and most of all, into the complex minds of each book's flawed heroes. To quote Graham Gibson, we all live as if we're immortal. The characters in this year's shortlist face this notion. They are not gods, but humans like us, facing the finiteness of life and those with whom we live. Before I announce the winner of this year's $60,000 prize, I want to take a moment to recognize the jury. A profuse thanks to the three members for their discerning judgment and tireless dedication in selecting the five finalists from over 130 submitted titles. They are David Bergen, Norma Dunning, and Andrew Forbes. So, once again, those five finalists are Manam by Zima El Khoury, translated by Phyllis Aronoff and Howard Scott, published by Mowensi House Publishers. Some Hellish uh, by Nicholas Herring, published by Goose Lane Editions. Karel Robergal by Kevin Lambert, translated by Donald Winkler and published by Biblio Oasis. Ezra's Ghosts by Darcy Tamayose, published by New West Press. And Her First Palestinian by Saeed Kibi, published by House of Anansi Press. Congratulations again to all five authors. <laughs> the winner of the 2022 Atwood Gibson Writers Trust Fiction Prize is down here. <laughs> I've never done this before. Nicholas Herring.
I didn't write a speech because I didn't think I was going to win. Um, oh my God. Uh, I just really have to thank everyone at Creeps Lane. Um, so if I forget any names, sorry. But, um, so uh, I, I have to thank uh, Suzanne and Alan and Kathy and Julie uh, who did the cover. final prize of the evening, but once again, I do want to uh, invite you into the worlds of the books and share some words from the jurors of this year's Hillary Reston Writers' Trust Prize for Nonfiction. In the petroleum papers, Jeff Dembicki shows us how the petroleum industry has known about the risks to the climate for more than 60 years. This is a book that connects the dots between the industry, politicians, lobbyists, fake grassroots groups, media, and corrupt think tanks. Basing his arguments on grounded research and using clear, accessible prose, Dembicki explains the players and the game, the stakes of the planet itself. Tara McGowan Ross unravels history and present for you all on clinching prose that is at once funny, heartbreaking, and lyrical. A coming of age reflection that is searing in its honesty, energy, and depth. McGowan Ross treads difficult topics such as death, loss, addiction, and grief with wryness, wit, and depth. With an intense voice resolutely and unapologetically her own, McGowan Ross dares readers to come along on a death defying, life affirming journey. Through direct and evocative prose, Deborah Thompson skillfully leads the reader into a rare perspective on the world of Canadian and American black love. Navigating the space between her father's ancestors who fled enslavement and her own life as one of the very few black women working in the field of political science, Thompson breaks ground in both countries. Engaging in personal and crisply political, the long road home illuminates how the experience of blackness cannot be explained by drawing a line at the 49th parallel. The COVID-19 pandemic has been the most disruptive event in world history since the Second World War. More than one million people have died. The global economy has been shaken. Anti-science, populist extremism has become a potent force. And other issues like climate change have been overshadowed by the debate over public health measures. Dan Word tells us how we got here through an authoritative scientific explanation of coronavirus. The Invisible Siege is a scientific detective story that leaves the reader frightened that the villain is still on the loose and maybe in the house. A collection that summons the reader into moving explorations of care and kinship with the land and with one another. Making love with the land is a lyrical personal journey to the Savior. Refusing the demand of categorization, Whitehead's beautiful book is in both parts arresting, inviting, and challenging. He writes with fluid dexterity in the English language, while acknowledging the complexity of creating and living in a language
knowledge that is not always enough.
just want to thank the jury, and I swear I thought they were a good jury before this moment, <laughs> but uh, my bias might be showing as well. And, you know, I wrote this book uh, to put boundaries on the anxiety and the fear that I felt when this pandemic started, and the journey of writing this book and being able to connect with people who had spent decades of their lives preparing for this moment and basically in the shadows was one of the most life-affirming experiences that I've, I've experienced myself. Um, and it was, it, it ended up being uh, what I wanted it to be, which was like an optimistic counter-narrative about the things that went right. And we don't hear that a lot. We haven't heard much about what went right over the last few years when we think about the pandemic, but so much did, and I'm, I just feel really humbled and blessed that I was able to uh, tell that story. And I also just want to acknowledge that one of the most beautiful parts of this whole thing, so thank you, Writers Trust, was to connect me with all of the incredible nominees in this category and to send me their books and to give me space to read them, and they are all incredible books, and I love them. And I am so uh, just so happy to have met them all and uh, and to have discovered their their beautiful books. So thanks so much. This has been amazing. Thank you.